All right, so we're now recorded. Let me go ahead and hide this thing here. Good morning. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Wednesday Galatians study. We're in Galatians chapter 2 and down to verse 13. Before we get started, we're going to have Brother Spencer lead us in a prayer. Brother Spencer. Just about it. God Almighty, it's, uh, it's so good to be stable, always abound in the work of the Lord. We pray and trust about We continue to let our light shine, let our love uh, exceed more uh, with gladness and receive your engraved word is able to save us and save those that we contact each day we do a golden deed. Be with the uh, uh, confections of those that had made mention uh, a few minutes ago, sickness and uh, tests and just be with the whole uh, one that had uh, been tested for different types of disease. Just be with us as we are uh, being tested today for the, the disease of sin. We pray that we keep our body without spots and blemish, that when you call us, we won't have no problem. Be with us with trials and tribulation. Be with us with the events and circumstances that we face traveling, just local, traveling long distance. Just be with those that are traveling. Be with the whole body of Christ that we might maintain, do the work of our Lord. But most of all, we do it in spirit and also in truth. Be with us while we about to embark upon the, uh, the book of Galatians. We pray that we glimpse and receive something that can help us with our knowledge and with our stability of our soul. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're looking at Galatians chapter 13. And by the way, have we done the questions for uh, chapter chapter two that usually I give you. Did we answer those questions there? There on uh, Galatians chapter two, it should say uh, Paul's second visit to 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 Jerusalem, and it, I think in your notes it's page thirty one. Did we get those questions answered or, or not? Uh, yeah, okay, that, that tells me we didn't. <laughs> uh, all right, but we didn't do them together. So, so, so let's go ahead and do them together so that we have them. Because I know some of you do the questions and I want to make sure that you at least get the answers that you're supposed to have or the ones that you can help us with. Remember, we're just doing the read through the chapter questions and they just come right from the chapter. And it should be easy for you to do, but uh, let's take a look at it. Number one says, how long was it until Paul saw the apostles a second time? 14 years. 14 years, okay. And who went with Paul to Jerusalem? Barnabas. All right, so Barnabas and Titus went. And what uh, for what reason does it say that Paul went to Jerusalem? All right, he went he went because of a revelation, right? And and we understand that that revelation was the revelation of the poor in Jerusalem. Now, number four, why was it Paul submitted to the other apostles his gospel? All right, for fear that he might run or had run in vain. Uh, number five, what was Titus compelled to do? All right, be circumcised. Number six, who compelled Titus to do this? False brethren. All right, and then, then number seven, why didn't Paul yield to them in this matter? All right, so the truth of the gospel would remain with you. Number eight. Uh, what did those of high reputation contribute to Paul's understanding of the gospel? Nothing. Nothing. They didn't contribute anything to him. Nine. What did the apostles understand about Paul's gospel? Uh, I'm sorry, I heard mumble, mumble. All right, that it was complete. Anything else? All right, that he was entrusted with the gospel just as, as Peter was to the Gentiles. Uh, number 10, 
who worked in Paul? The Holy Spirit, okay. And then number 11, what did those of high reputation give to Paul and Barnabas? The right hand of fellowship, there, there you go. Number 12, who did the apostles urge Paul to remember? The poor, let's remember the poor. And then 13, recount the reason why Paul withstood Peter to the face. Why did Paul withstand Peter to the face? All right, so he was eating with the Gentiles, and then when men from James came, he withdrew from them, and so Paul confronted him, right? Okay. Number 14, what question did Paul ask Peter? All right, so the, qu the question was, why are you living one way and telling people to live a different way, right? In relationship to the Gentiles. Number 15, how was it Paul told Peter we were justified? By faith in Christ. And how would Christ be found a minister of sin? Okay, but how would he be found a minister of sin? Uh, okay, if we're teaching people to be justified one way and we're doing it a different way, right? Okay. Uh, Lane, did you have something? No. Okay. All right. Uh, 16. How would Christ be found in, oh, sorry, 17. Uh, how does one become a transgressor? By building what we tear down or by tearing down what we've built. Okay. And why did, uh, why did we die through the law? All right, that we might live for God. And then question number 19 says, with whom was Paul crucified? With Christ, okay? And 20, how would Christ have died needlessly? All right, if we're not justified by faith in him, right? Okay, uh, so now uh, in your notes, if you wanna, if you wanna be in, in your notes, I want you to look down here at you, on your paper, if you want to follow along on your paper, you would be down here in page about 46 is where we're at, where we're starting off. But we're looking here in Galatians chapter two. And one of the things that we noticed was that uh, Titus was compelled to be circumcised when they had gone to take money for the saints in Jerusalem, which happened around chapter 11, at the end of chapter 11 and 12. And then we noticed in chapter 14, Paul went on his missionary journey, and it was in chapter 15 that they had the, the covenant of the, the conference about circumcision. And so in between chapter 14 and 15, you have the book of Galatians that was written, but Paul is talking about an event when he talks about Peter that probably happened sometime after chapter 11, maybe chapter 12, when, when uh, Herod had killed James and had arrested Peter, and then the angel released Peter, and it says that Peter went off. So it's possible that's during that time that he had gone up to Antioch, getting away from Herod, and at that time he came, and that's the discussion we're having that begins in verse 11. And so in verse 11, we have this discussion that's happening over here. Now, remember, Paul is writing it over here, and uh, as he wrote the book of Galatians here, after his journey, here's where he wrote Galatians, but it's talking about the events that probably happened right here. And we can't be sure, but we do know that it happened before chapter 14. And so these are the events with Peter right here. And this is what he's talking about. He's talking about that when Peter came up, they were having this, they were having this discussion, okay? And, and so it says, let me just start verse 11, and, and we're in 13, but let me just read verse 11 because that's where it starts. It says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to the face because he stood condemned. Now, who's Cephas? Peter. All right, just another name for Peter. Verse 12. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. So remember that Jerusalem is down here. If I put a map here for you, here's Jerusalem down here. Here's the Dead Sea. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's the, here's the Sea of Galilee. And Antioch would be up here. Uh, 
Antioch is a Gentile church, and Jerusalem is a Jewish church. And Jerusalem is, you might say, the mother church. That's where everything started from. And according to Isaiah chapter 2, it was supposed, the law was supposed to go forth from Jerusalem. And so that's where it started from. And Peter was up here during this time over here that Peter had escaped from Herod. So Peter's up here, you might say, in hiding with the Gentile brethren. And while he's there, he's eating with them, associating with them. He's uh, had them in fellowship. Uh, and then all of a sudden, some men come from Jerusalem over to uh, uh, Antioch. And when they see Peter eating with the Gentiles, they refuse and they held them themselves aloof. They held themselves aloof, uh, and Peter even held himself aloof because it says in verse 12, fearing the party of the circumcision. So he was afraid of the party of the circumcision because Peter was down here from Jerusalem, and some of these people came up, and they basically apparently were saying something like, well, this isn't what James teaches. James doesn't teach that you can accept the Gentiles unless they get circumcised and follow the law of Moses. And so that's what was going on up here. And so when that happened, even, even Peter went and held himself aloof. And so now there's a division between God's people. And verse 13 is where we're at. And it says, and the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy. Now, when it says the rest of the Jews, that meant the rest of the Jews that formerly had been up here in, Jeru in, uh, in Antioch with the Gentiles. Remember, <laughs> Remember that it started off by Barnabas and the apostles, and they were Jews, or uh, Paul, and they were Jews. And so Jews were associating up here with the church at Antioch with the Gentiles, and Jews and Gentiles were functioning together, meeting together, worshiping together, eating together, doing things together. And then all of a sudden, when these men came down from, from Jerusalem, uh, they saw what was going on, and they saw that the Gentiles weren't circumcised or weren't keeping the law of Moses. Then they separated themselves, and even these Jews that had been with the church at Antioch for probably a long time since its inception, they also went over there and held themselves aloof. So then you basically had two groups. You had the Gentiles, and you had the Jews, and you had those two groups. And the Jews were basically saying that the Gentiles weren't good enough. So if you kind of if you kind of look at it like this, you go to church on Sunday, or when the brethren meet and the and the church is full, the you know the place is full, or at least the usual people are there. You go the next Sunday and you look, and there's only Gentile people. That's all who showed up. And so you might be wondering what in the world's going on. And that's that's what you have going on here. And the Jews would be meeting in their own place. And they're acting like they can't meet with you because you're not good enough. And that's what the word aloof means. The word aloof doesn't just mean separate. It means to hold yourself in a higher position than the people that you're holding yourself aloof from. Uh, and, and so that, that's what they had. Now, verse 13 says, the rest of the Jews joining hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. So Barnabas was one of these original Jews up here. And when this happened, Barnabas even separated himself. Now, Barnabas went up there to help the church. When the church in Antioch first started, Barnabas was the one who went up. And, and many people were converted as a result of Barnabas, and those were Gentile people. And then Barnabas called Paul, and Paul came up, and they began to teach other people for, for a year at least. And they were teaching them. And so these Jews were eating and associating with the Gentiles without having the Gentiles uh, to keep the law of Moses or the kosher foods or any of those things. Uh, and so all of a sudden, when these Jews from, when these brethren from Jerusalem came up and they saw what was going on, they held themselves aloof. All of the Jews then went over and began to sit with them. And so somebody had to make a statement about what was going on here. And that's what Paul is doing. And that's why it's done publicly. This is done publicly because this was a public thing. It wasn't something done in secret. It wasn't a private. It wasn't somebody's private sin that you're supposed to go to personally and correct them. This was a public sin, and it was a sin that was causing division in the church, and that's the reason why it was confronted publicly, and Paul did it publicly, but he says in verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy. Now, notice that he called it hypocrisy. Now, what's hypocrisy? I'm sorry? Practicing a lie? It's more than just practicing a lie. What is hypocrisy? Okay, it's saying one thing and doing another. 
The word hypocrisy comes from the word actor in the, in the Greek and an actor is somebody who acts. They're not acting the part that they are, they're acting some other part. And when we go to the movies, we understand that those are actors and they're acting other parts. So that's not hypocrisy, but it's hypocrisy if you're acting like you're not. And so these, these Jews here who had first been with the church at Antioch, they associated with them. Now all of a sudden they act like they can't. And so now they're acting in a way that's contrary to what they had been acting. And so therefore he, he calls them hypocrites. He, he says they're practicing hypocrisy. They're saying one thing, uh, or they're practicing one thing, and they're saying another thing. Uh, they, they joined with the, with the church as long as they were there, but then all of a sudden these men came up, and because of fear, they then separated themselves. And that's one thing that we need to remember. What causes separation in the church a lot of times is fear. It's the fear of some other church going, oh, you guys don't do what we do? Well, then you must not be part of God's family. Or somebody else coming up and saying, you guys do this? Why? We don't do that. And so we become fearful. We're not supposed to do anything out of fear. We're supposed to do things because of what the scriptures teach us. And fear causes a lot of people to do things that aren't in, in God's word, uh, just simply in order for you to feel less fearful or less stressed instead of doing what God says. And that's one of the reasons why we tell people that we don't, we don't function from our emotional standpoint. We don't function and say, well, how do I feel about it? And that's going to determine what I do. We're supposed to do what's right, and our feelings will conform to what we do. But these people were afraid, and no doubt Peter was afraid, because Peter's home church is in Jerusalem, and if he happened to go back to Jerusalem, and those brethren said, yeah, this is the guy who ate with the, with the, the uh, Gentiles, they might not accept him. And so the, quote, mother church, quote, you know, in, in quotation marks, the mother church might reject Peter. And of course, I've told you before that it's interesting that the only apostle that we have that was publicly reprimanded is the same apostle that the Catholic Church claims to be infallible and that, you know, they say he's the first pope. And so that's, that's really interesting, I think. Uh, but it says that the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Now, so there's hypocrisy going on. Well, somebody needs to stop this. Somebody needs to correct this. So verse 14 says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Now, I told you before that there is truth to the gospel. You can't have any kind of gospel you want. There's truth to the gospel. Remember, the gospel, the word gospel means good news. There's only one kind of good news. Okay, anytime we change the good news, it's no longer good news, but it's a gospel of another kind. That really isn't a gospel. Remember, he said that in Galatians 1 and verse 6. And so what he's, what he's pointing out here is Paul is going, I have to correct this because this appears to teach a truth that isn't truth. In other words, this separation between the Gentiles and the Jews, and now you have these two churches separated, and people are going to think that that's the way it is. That's not the truth. The truth is that both of these groups are supposed to be one. We're supposed to be one in Christ. And so when you think of our world today, we have this separation galore when it comes to religion. One group might believe something different, so they start their own, own church, and they're different from this group over here, and one group won't associate with the other group because that group believes something different, or they think something different, and I'm not talking about fundamentals of the gospel. I'm talking about just doctrinal issues. There's churches of Christ that won't associate with other churches of Christ because they do certain things that those churches of Christ don't think you should do, and so it causes all these separations. And one, one group of Church of Christers called the other group of Church of Christers liberal, and the other ones call them conservative, and they get all these names going around. And that's the same thing you have going on here. And that's what Paul is trying to correct, because the, the gospel is designed to bring unity. Not, it's not designed to bring disunity. It's designed to bring unity. In uh, uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 2, where Paul is talking about the the relationship that we sustain with, with God through Jesus, he says, beginning at verse, at verse 11, talking about the Jew and the Gentile problem, 
He says, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that at that time you, uh, at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope in the world and without uh, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, I want to suggest to you, he's not saying that's a fact. What he's saying is that's the way they were treated by the Jews. The Jews treated the Gentiles that way. God has always been working with the Gentiles. God has wanted to save the Gentiles. That's the reason he called uh, the, the um, patriarch Abraham. He called Abraham so that all the families of the world could be blessed. So they had part of the, 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 the relationship with God. Now, they didn't have that, that commonwealth as far as the nation of Israel had, but God was working to save them. But the Jewish people looked at them like, because they weren't from the right family, therefore they had no relationship with God. They didn't have a right to the kingdom and they didn't have a right to all these things. That, but he says in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandment contained in ordinance so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And he reconciled them both in one body to God through the cross, uh, by it having put to death the enmity. And the enmity that God put to that Jesus put to death is sin. And the reason that we're going to get to heaven isn't because we found the right church. The reason we're getting to heaven is because Jesus forgave us for our sins. So if anybody gets to heaven, why are they getting there? They're getting there by the grace of God and because Jesus forgives them for their sins. But what if they go to a different church? I guess God can't forgive them from their sins, just us. No, of course not. The, the idea is, is that we're, we're going to get to heaven because we're trusting and believing in Jesus. But this apparent division between Jews and Gentiles makes it look like one group is better than another group and the other group is unworthy the way they are. And in Jesus, we find that, that we're complete in Jesus. Now, does that mean that I believe everything that every church in the entire world teaches? Of course not. We're following Jesus. But there's a difference. There's a difference between me not believing something and me condemning somebody because they don't believe exactly what I believe. Because we're not in the position of condemning. We're not in the position of judging uh, from the standpoint of condemning people. And that's why John the Baptist said that there's one coming who will baptize you with fire or the Holy Spirit, or it says, and the Holy Spirit, but you're either going to be cursed or you're going to be blessed. And the one who has the right to curse you or bless you is who? God. I don't have the right to curse you or bless you. Now I can, I can make a personal judgment about not doing what you do because I think it's wrong, but that doesn't mean God can't forgive you or that you're not doing it because you think it's, it's done by faith. And so we need to understand that. So, but, but somebody needs to stand up he needs to stand up for Jesus. And the other thing I want you to notice is, is they're standing up against religious people. These are religious people they're standing up against. Jesus, when he was uh, alive during the gospel period, the people Jesus confronts are not necessarily the sinners. He ate with sinners. He dealt with sinners. He spent time with sinners. It was the religious elite of his day who thought they were better than other people because they were keeping the rules and the regulations of the Old Testament, and they thought that made them better people and therefore fit subjects uh, in order to receive the blessings of God. And so uh, notice again that here, the problem isn't with sinners. The problem is with, with, with religious people. And so we really need to be careful and understand that, that we might be the, pe the people that Jesus has problems with when he shows up. Not the people out there that we're trying to shun, uh, which, by the way, we shouldn't be. Uh, and so uh, Paul is pointing out that, <clears throat> that somebody had to stand up. So stand up for, stand up for, for uh, God. And by the way, the, the reason that, tr that truth fails is not because it's truth, because truth is always truth, but it's because people refuse to stand up for the truth. That's why it fails. People... people uh, refuse to stand up because of fear, because people are going to, you know, won't like them. And so you have all these, you have all these fad movements that are going around and forbid you say something that doesn't agree with them and you get ostracized and you get 
thrown out because you don't agree with them. Well, we need, we need to understand that that happens in a religion too. Verse 14, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, here's the problem. I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles, now I want to stop there for just a second. So that means that Paul, uh, Peter was a Jew and he was living like the Gentiles. He came over here and he ate with them. He ate with the Gentiles. That's what he means by he lived like the Gentiles, okay? So Peter was over here eating with the Gentiles. He was living with the Gentiles but while, before the men from James came up. He was associating with them. He was acting like, like everything's okay. And it says, if you being a Jew, and he was a Jew, live like the Gentiles, because he was, and not like the Jews. In other words, when he's living with the Gentiles, he wasn't observing the Jewish customs and the Jewish laws. That's not what he was observing when he was eating with the Gentiles. He was accepting them on the basis of their uh, faith in Jesus. And it says, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? He says, you're over here living like the Gentiles, but then you want the Gentiles to come over and live like Jews. He said, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. How in the world can you do that? That's what hypocrisy is. Hypocrisy is you say one thing or you believe one thing and you do a different thing. That's what hypocrisy is. And that's why Paul had to correct this. And that's why in the book of Galatians, as we've looked at, he doesn't have any place in there when he starts off in his, in his introduction that says, oh, I thank God for you guys. He does in the other churches when he writes and they have, they have problems, they have doctrinal problems, but he says, I thank God for you guys, but not for the Galatians. He says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not another. Only there'll be some that trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And so that's what, that's what he's pointing out. So Paul says, somebody has to stand up because it, it, it's not right. You're, you're, not, you're not practicing what you preach. And the other, thing that, the other thing that I try to get you to think about is that God doesn't inspire the action of the apostles. God inspires the message of the apostles. The apostles have to do exactly the same thing you and I do when we hear a message from God. We either believe it and we do it, or we disbelieve it and we don't do it. And the apostles had to do the same thing. And Peter had a hard time with this concept, and you can probably understand why, because he was raised as a Jew, a strict Jew, and he, he uh, uh, you know, didn't eat unclean meat, uh, unlike maybe some of the, some of the uh, other uh, apostles that, that uh, Jesus called. The only one that we really know of his, of, of his food habits is Peter, because when the sheet was let down, Peter said, I've never done this. And so it's interesting that the, that the person who never had done this is the one who has problems with this because that's his paradigm he had in the back. And sometimes it takes a while to get away from that paradigm. And so that's what's going on here. And so any questions then down this far? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a little different though. Well, kind of. Uh, that's le that's leaving Jesus, you might say. Okay, but these guys aren't leaving Jesus. They're trying to stay with Jesus, but they're acting contrary to what he teaches. You know, in the sense of fellowship. Elaine. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. That was before this happened. Right. That was an Acts so 10. That was an Acts 10. Yeah. So he goes over there knowing he has these men to whom he's going to go over here and get his trick. Right. After the he goes, he had the vision. After he had the vision. I mean, yes. Vision, yes. I, I'm not, I'm, well, it's showing the, the, the carnality that he can have it. Well, it's. It, yeah, what, what, it, what it shows is that even though he was inspired, he had to figure out how to, how to do what God says. Right. And, that's right. Yeah. Uh, a lot of us know that we shouldn't yell and scream at our wives, but we do, or our husbands. A lot of us know that we shouldn't lose our temper, but we do. 
a lot of us know that we shouldn't do certain things, but, but we succumb to them, right? Okay. But the difference is, is those God will forgive. If you deny Jesus, if you deny the way of being saved, yeah, there's no way for you to be saved. And that's why he said, I'm amazed that you're deserting Christ, who saved you by the grace of Christ. Okay. So now, how, how is that possible that, that Peter uh, is doing this and that Paul has to correct them? And the answer is because of the principle of how people are saved. And how is that principle? Well, that's what he's going to get into beginning in verse 15. In verse 15, you're going to have the principle of how it is that people are saved and what it is that justifies people in a very condensed statement. Then in chapters 3, 4, and 5, he's going to get into it with the text, and he's going to get into it in detail, but he's giving us a condensed version of why it is that he had to confront Peter and these men who were causing a division in the church and making it seem like there was this division between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians that couldn't be remedied unless the, the Gentile Christians agreed with every practice that the Jewish Christians were doing. And so in, in verse 15, it says, he says, and he's talking, remember, he's talking to Peter. He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of, of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now, as we get into this, he's talking to Peter. He's pointing out from the Jewish perspective, because that's the problem. The problem is the Jewish perspective. So he's talking about a Jew. He's talking about from the Jewish perspective. He says, we are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Now, when he makes this distinction, what he's saying is, is we know better. We're supposed to know better. Well, why? Well, because they have the law. They have the prophets. They have, they have advantages over the Gentile people. But the Gentiles, the Gentiles, they're walking in sin because they don't know. They, they don't know that it's sinful. They don't know that they're not supposed to do those things. They, they naturally, normally do those things that are sinful because they're born into a natural, normal world that does sinful practices. The Jewish community was born into the nation of God, and they're supposed to know sin. They're supposed to know what sin is, uh, and they're supposed to uh, be people who embrace it. Of course, when you look at the history of Israel, what kind of people do you see? Sinners. God had to send them off into Assyrian captivity and into Babylonian captivity. God used the nations against them many times to try to bring them back to repentance. But they were supposed to know. They were supposed to know. Right? Just like Christians are supposed to know you don't commit adultery. Christians are supposed to know that. Now, people in, in the world, they don't necessarily know that. You know, the, the government doesn't make adultery this crime. I mean, if you want to commit adultery and dump your wife, you know, they'll give you a, they'll give you a letter that says it's okay for you to do that. So they don't know. So the word, so one thing I want you to understand is this word nature, this word nature that's used here is not talking about birth, not talking about when you were born, you were born sinful. Because if that's the case, then what he's pointing out is that the Jews weren't born sinful, but the Gentiles were born sinful. When he's talking about nature, he says uh, in, in verse two, he says, for we are Jews by nature. He's talking about what you and I would call second nature. It's second nature. Well, what's the difference between nature and second nature? Oh, okay. One, one just happens without my permission. The other one, I have to learn it, okay? I am, a, I, I, I am of Mexican descent by nature. There's nothing I can do to change that. I don't care what California says. I don't care if California says that you can decide that, you, you know, that I want to be African-American because I feel like it. The fact is I was born you know, of, of Mexican descent. That's nature. I had no choice about it. Now, to speak Spanish like most... Uh, uh, Mexican ancestry people speak is second nature. 
I had to learn it because I grew up here and therefore I learned English and had to learn Spanish as a second language, which is usually the other way around. And so when he talks about nature, he's not talking about you were born that way. What he's talking about is that's the way you grew up. That's the system you grew up in. And that's why he says the Gentiles are sinners because they grow up in what kind of a system? A sinful system. They're, they, they don't listen to God. They don't, you know, especially in our culture today, if you, you know, if, if you take a kid and you put him in school, he doesn't believe in God. He's taught evolution. He, he's taught, you know, you can pick your gender. He's taught you can, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want to do and it's basically okay. Uh, and, and so he's, he grows up in a sinful environment. The Jewish people would have, would have, would have supposedly been in a more moral society and they should have learned how to be more moral. And that's what he means when he talks about we who are, who, are, who are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. That's what he's talking about. And the reason I point this out is because there's some people who want to tell you that people are born in sin, that we're born in sin, and it's just our nature to sin. And I have a big problem with that because Jesus was born just like that, and he didn't sin. So it's not our nature to sin because Jesus was born like us. And if it's natural for us to sin because it's our nature, the way we're born, then Jesus, who would have been born just like us, would have also sinned, but he didn't because it's a choice. We choose to sin. We choose to, to not do what's right. So having said all that, it says we, we are Jews by nature, not sinners from among the Gentiles. In other words, Paul is saying we know better. We know the difference between sin and we know the difference between right and wrong. Now, nevertheless, he says, even though that's true, something happens. There's something else. He says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law. He says, even though we grew up in a system that was more moral than the Gentiles did, we know what? What does he say? He says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is what? Not by what? By works of the law. He says, even though we know the law, even though we know moral, uh, moral issues, even though we know right from wrong and the Gentiles don't, we know that we're not saved by works of the law. Now, in the Greek, I want you to understand something. Every time we see the expression, the law, we go in our head, Old Testament law. And so when, when he says we're not justified by law, we think Old Testament law. So I'm not justified by Old Testament law. Well, of course, I'm under a new law. I have a new law in Jesus. I'm not saved under the Old Testament law. Here's what I want you to understand. In the Greek, there is no the. In the Greek, it's just law. They put, they put the word the in because in our language we have definite and indefinite articles and paul is referring to law but let me ask you a question was abraham saved because he never lied wait abraham's the father of the faith what do you mean he never lied he did what did he lie about oh sarah his wife well then how in the world could he get to heaven The, the law came, and it was added because of transgression. And so David got to heaven because David never sinned. What? That, that's not true either? Well, how did David get to heaven? God said he was a man after my own heart. How did he get to heaven? Because God forgave him. It wasn't by him keeping the law. And I can go through the Old Testament law and I can give you example after example after example that indicates that they were not saved by law keeping. Not just the when, the, when Israel got the law of Mount Sinai, not just that law. The Old Testament teaches that nobody's been saved by law. How many laws that we know of does, Abraham, does Adam and Eve have? Well, they had a couple, you know. Yeah. Well, we, we say the patriarchal law. They were under God's law, just like everybody else is, depending on where we live. But here's the point I'm trying to make. Adam and Eve, we don't have a list of laws they had, do we? Don't eat the fruit and cultivate the ground. Be fruitful, multiply, 
pretty much that's it, right? How many did they break? <laughs> well, they, they broke one and that's enough, right? There you go. So that's what I want you to understand, that when he says here, the law, you might think in your head, Old Testament law. So yeah, that makes sense. We're not under the Old Testament law. We're under New Testament law. So I, if I keep the new system, then I'm going to get to heaven because the old system didn't save me. But I got a new system that if I keep it and do it good enough, then I'm going to be able to get to heaven. And what's wrong with that problem? What's wrong with that paradigm? It's, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. No matter how many laws God gives me, I'm not good enough. So what he's saying is we, even though we live moral laws, he, Paul's talking about the Jews, even though we Jews live moral laws, we didn't grow up in sinful condition. We didn't grow up, you know, living without the law, living without any way of knowing what's right and wrong. We had the law. He says, even we understand that we weren't justified. And by the way, in the Greek, the word justified and the word righteous are exactly the same word in the Greek. We, we use justified sometimes and we use righteous sometimes, but it's the exact same Greek word. There is no distinction between the two. And so what he's pointing out here is that uh, uh, we as, as, as Jews, he's saying, understand that our righteousness, our justification was not based on law keeping. Now, somebody says, well, then they didn't have to keep the law. Well, they were supposed to do what God says because they're trusting him. But it wasn't law keeping that was going to save them. It was them trusting Jesus. I'm sorry, them trusting God. Because God said that he promised Abraham a seed who would bless the whole world. And so they're waiting for the promise of God to come. And in the meantime, they have some things to do that would help them demonstrate their faith in God. And so what he says is, nevertheless... Knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So he says through faith, through faith in Christ Jesus. By faith in Christ Jesus. Now, what's faith? Trusting God. So the way we get right with God is by trusting Jesus, which means what? What does Jesus mean? What does the word Jesus mean? Matthew chapter 1, you call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. What does Christ mean? Messiah, king, God's king, God's anointed. So the way that we're going to be saved is by trusting God's anointed Savior. By trusting the one who's going to save us, the king who can save us. I can't save you. A church can't save you. A philosophy can't save you. A system of laws can't save you. The only thing who can save you is the king of salvation. He's the only one who can trust you. Now, we look at this word faith, and we take that word faith, and I think sometimes we change it. What does faith mean? Trust. See, we sometimes take that word faith and we turn it into faith means the system that Jesus gave us. And that's what we turn it into. So therefore, there are certain things I got to do in order for me to get saved. And if I don't do these things, these, this system, then I'm not going to be saved. Okay. Sometimes it goes even to the point where I, I got to find the right church. I got to find the right preacher. I got to find the, the, the right version of the Bible. I got to find the, the, you know, listen to the right commentaries. And after a while, we get to the point where we're following the tradition of the elders instead of following Jesus. Or you're following Mike because he screams and yells a lot instead of following <laughs> Jesus. It's faith in Christ. How was Abraham going to be saved? In who? In the promised one who was going to bless the world. How was Isaac going to be saved? By trusting in God bringing a Savior. How was Jacob going to be saved? By trusting God was going to bring a Savior. 
All of the animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, what did they teach? It takes somebody to die for you, for you to be forgiven. It's not you. I'm sorry. There has to be a sacrifice for you. Something has to be sacrificed for you. You're saved because somebody else did something. Now, what the Jews thought was, I killed the animal, so therefore I'm good enough because I killed it. Instead of understanding, no, that animal represents somebody who's going to die for me, and I am accepting him by putting my hands on top of him. Remember all those little details about the sacrifices? You know, it had to be clean, it had to be pure, it had to be, and you cut it up to make sure there's no tumors inside of it. And, you know, you do, and, you, and, and, and we really go, what in the world does that mean? Well, it's a picture of Jesus. And you put your hands on Jesus and you say, take away my sins. And so even though the Jews by nature are supposed to be, if I can put it this way, don't take it wrong, better uh, moral people, that's not what saved them. What saved them was by believing in this Christ Jesus who was going to come and save them. There's a lot of what you and I would call good moral Jews who are moral people. You'd love to have them as neighbors. There's a lot of good moral Muslims. We only, you know, we only hear about the bad ones, the ones that you know want to blow us up. But there's a lot of pleasant, wonderful, good Muslims. But that's not how we're saved. We're not saved by being good moral people and finding finding the right path, whether it's Buddha or whether it's Muhammad or, or whether it's Joseph Smith or whether it's following some, some other person or some other philosophy. We're saved because we're trusting in the coming Messiah. That's why Jesus told the woman at the well, you don't know what you worship, but salvation is from the Jews. See, Jesus was coming from the Jewish community for the purpose of saving people. So that's why they should have known. So they should have known. Uh, that's what he's saying, yes. Right. 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 That's right. Because I might, I'm not saying I do, I might look good to people on the outside, but if you knew what was on the inside, you'd know I'm a sinner. And that's why they cut up those animals, like Susan is saying, to make sure there's nothing wrong on the inside. Because Jesus wasn't just clean on the outside. Jesus was clean on the inside, but it still required something to die for you. So Paul is saying there's no way, Peter, you and I should have gone through the Old Testament without understanding that. Now, Paul can say that now because he's no longer persecuting Christians. So it's interesting to me that the apostle that corrects Peter was the apostle who was actually in the middle of persecuting Christians at one time. And so now he's the one who's correcting Peter because you don't hear anything about, you know, Thomas or the other apostles. They, they didn't do anything, but you have these two guys. And, it, and I think that's really interesting, the, the dynamics that God uses this person who used to be like, like Peter, even to the point of killing Christians. And now he says, you know, Peter, we were messed up, man. We, we were wrong. We, we're not saved by the works of the law. And so he says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus. Now, the we is the we Jews. He says, we Jews. We Jews believe in Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, when they preach to the Jewish community, what did they tell them to do when the brethren who were listening says to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What were they told? And what? Why? For? For the forgiveness of your sins. You want to have your sins forgiven, Peter? Then you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in order to have your sins forgiven. That's what they taught the Jews. 
That's exactly what they didn't teach the Jews. Keep following the law because that law makes you better people. No, he said, you, you need to have your sins forgiven. Your sins are still contrary to your relationship with God, and you need to fix those. And the way you remedy those is by having somebody redeem you, who is our brother, in their case, their brother, and their older brother was able to, or their younger brother was able to redeem them and buy them back by his death. And so that's why he says, and not by works of the law, well, actually, he says, uh, in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified in Christ and not by works of the law. And again, remember that it's not, it's not the law, it's just law, justified by law. He says, since by the works of law, no flesh will be justified. So the idea that people are saved because they're doing the right thing, they're keeping the right law, they have it figured out. Is that right or wrong? It's wrong. Then what is it that saves us? Trusting in Jesus. Trusting in Jesus. And Susan might believe some other things than I do while she's trusting in Jesus. So Jesus can't save one of us. Is that right? No, Jesus can save both of us as long as she's doing what? Jesus. Trusting in Jesus. And what am I doing? Trusting in Jesus. Because trusting in Jesus is also a journey to growth, isn't it? Hopefully I'm a better person now than I was before when I first became a Christian. Hopefully I'm, I'm a better person. I'm more moral. But that's not what saved me. Yes. Okay. You may help us when my husband died um, two years ago, I was I rushed to the hospital, and I, the first thing I said was, well, I mean, not the first thing, but I said, well, would you be him? Because he's a child of God. And what he said to me was, Elaine, I repented for being not my husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what that means. Right. But God knows what it means. Exactly, yeah. Yep. And so my point is, he had been gone for years, like decades. But he believed in Jesus. Right. 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 And that's what you're saying. Right. Believe in Jesus, and nobody else can cast doubt on your faith. That's you right. That's right. And, and and what we're supposed to do with one another is encourage one another. Was this separation between Jews and Gentiles encouraging them? No. No. It was making one group think they were arrogant, and the other group think that they were not good enough. That's what it was doing. What do we do when we do that? Same thing. Is that any different? It's the same thing. And by the way, <clears throat> in case you're not sure, that's what the Church of Christ is. The Church of Christ is people who are trusting in Jesus, period. That's what we are. We're the church of Christ. You can also be called the church of God. You can also be called the church of the firstborn. You can also be called all sorts of different names. Yeah, without the, other yeah, the other part, that's true. Because we are Latter-day Saints, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the point I'm making is, is we add all these things to how somebody's going to be saved so that we can bring people into bondage so that we won't be afraid if another Church of Christ or some big wig preacher who's a reputation in the church comes and says, well, I don't believe that. It's been done. So, yes, sir. Absolutely. That's right. Read the word. <laughs> I do my best to tell you where I'm at right now. That, that, that's all I, I'm doing. And it says, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. I really want you to read that and let it soak in. By the works of law, no flesh will be justified. That's what it says. That means me too. What do you want, Sandy? 
Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I, I want to tell you what I think, because I don't know what's going on in heaven. Jesus is our advocate, and he certainly advocates for us. He's our lawyer up there. So in the, in the metaphor of a law court, he does stand before God and says, you know, Mike was an idiot when he did that. But I want you to forgive him, not because he's so good, because I paid for the price. So he's also our, he's not only our advocate, he's also our propitiation. He's what's paid. So he's going before God to present to God, not only the fact that he's defending us, but the fact that he's paying the thing for us. So it's a little different, you know, because we think of a lawyer, somebody who defends us to prove we're right or wrong. Jesus doesn't defend us going, he's right and you messed up, God. Okay, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus is going, God, you're right. He's a wreck but I'm paying for it. I'm his lawyer bringing the necessary funds or the necessary proceeds to pay for what he's done. So it's, so it's right. Yeah. And, and every time we sin, he's talking, because I guess he'd be talking all the time. Then. <laughs> At least for me, he would not. I don't know about you guys. Okay. Now. Oh, yes, sir. Right. They stone Stephen. Right. Right. Uh huh. Sure. The base, the yeah, basis, yes. The basis of, of that whole debate in the organization was that in, in Hebrews chapter one, I think, God actually is talking to Christ. He said, uh -huh. You are the spirit of the living, living, living. Right. So, based on that, when this is an advocate, the advocate speaks to somebody. Sure. Right. So that was the basis. So he's not just there discussing whatever it is. Right. right sure. Yeah, now Ben's going to tell us the truth about all this. No, my thoughts are just that we don't understand God in the way that He works. Right. Right? And so we have to we have to take the greatness of God and dumb it down. <laughs> That's right. That's right. To That's right. Level yeah. To try and get some stuff, but then when we try to and while the human level is what really is going on there, right. then we are in one sense doing what you were saying the Jews did. <laughs> right. You're making human law apply right. right to God. That's right. And yeah. That doesn't happen. So Jesus is our advocate. Right. And yes, he is there pleading for us, which is a very good thing. Yep. Right. But he also it's not say there to defend us. Right. He's there to pay for us. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, 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 it's really hard when we start talking about God in human terms. Right. And that's why that's why he uses metaphors yes. that we can understand, but we got to be careful that, like you said, that we don't dumb it down. Because all of my classes are dumbing down God's work. I guarantee you. Yeah. I used to say that that's the reason we never need to pray. Right. 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 That's right. That, that's why we pay, pray through Jesus. Okay. Let me see if we can't finish this little section here. Okay. Now, 
uh, verse, uh, last part of verse 16 says, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But, is even though that's true, but if, if while seeking to be justified in Christ, in other words, he already told us that we're not saved by law keeping. So these people, these Jews are requiring the Gentiles to keep these laws. Paul just said, we're not saved by law keeping. So then those Gentiles keeping those laws aren't what's going to save them. Okay. Having said that, he says, but if we, that's we Jews, but if while, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found sinners, is Christ the minister of sin? May it never be. And I personally believe what he's referring to is we, not just the Jews, but we the apostles especially. Because he's an apostle, he's supposed to be he's supposed to be preaching the word of God, and so what he's pointing out is that if we understand we're saved by by faith and we're not saved by law keeping, but yet you're telling people that they have to keep the law in order to be saved, then we have become sinners, and and that's not right because Christ isn't a Christ of sinners. He he's not he's not sin. He doesn't he doesn't say one thing and then do another thing. It's not the Holy Spirit says one thing and Jesus says another thing and God says another thing. They all speak exactly the same. They all have the same nature and same character and they speak exactly the same. But if Peter is preaching one, doing one thing and preaching another thing, then it looks like Christ is sinful. That's what it looks like. That looks like Christ is sinful. Now, here's what I want you to understand. That looks like Christ is sinful. What do I mean by that? Division among God's people makes it look like God is sinful. That's why Jesus said, they will know you by what? By your love. By your love. Not by everything you know, but by your love. Do you love people? Or do you separate from people? Do you think you're better than people? Do you think that you're smarter than people? Do you, do you think that you deserve more than other people deserve? Or are you trusting in Jesus to save us? And so that's what he means in verse 17. When he says, but if we, if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves are also to be found sinners, is Christ the minister of sin? May it never be. And because you guys listen too slowly, <laughs> Our time is up. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you. We thank you because you know us. You created us. You know how we are. You know, Father, that we need guidance when it comes to how to live our life. We know that we're sinful. We know that we've grown up in a sinful environment, in a sinful society. And we know, Father, that we don't always do what we're supposed to do. And so we thank you that you've given us principles and rules to teach us how to, how to live. But we're especially thankful, Father, that you don't leave our salvation up to our own devices, but that you save us through your son, Jesus. We pray, Father, that you help us to put our faith more and more into your son, and not in some church, and not in some philosophy, but into your son, Jesus. We pray that you mold us and make us more like him and forgive us for when we're not, because Jesus is not the author of sin. We praise you and we thank you, Father, for all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. PGM.